All right. You all should get a little note that says, you wanna continue uh, with the recording. If you say yes, then it will be recorded for you. Otherwise you will not be able to continue. Um, what we are doing is recording this for later use. We are finding that the, the possibility of all these webinars that we're doing will lead us to a great cache of uh, recorded videos. We will have it on YouTube. We don't know exactly where the links are going to land. So be patient as we work through this and figure out where we're gonna put these links. One of the places that we will have them for sure is on the VMS on the right hand side under all the educational uh, programs that you could attend. And then we'll also make sure they're out there in other um, different locations. Um, I would ask for today's purpose to hold any questions you have specific to the spotted lanternfly until the end. Um, there is a lot, there were a lot of questions coming in. If you all start flooding with questions, um, I'm not gonna be able to keep up with them and we want Amy to keep going. So unless it's a clarification question, I'll be monitoring the questions, unless it's a clarification question, uh, please hold your questions to the end and we will have time then to, for Q&A. Uh, and again, we are going to record this for later use and we appreciate your, your time and commitment. Also, I appreciate your flexibility. We did have some challenges with setting this up since it was our first time. Um, I wanted to put it at 11.30 to 1.30. Uh, just so everybody could get on. So we had the time to make sure we were, you know, in good shape. So it did cause confusion and I apologize for that. That was my error. The next one that comes out will be uh, set up for 12 to one o'clock. And those next ones next Tuesday will be best practices for MGs and community gardens with Jacqueline Kowalski and Mike Hogan. Thursday, April 3rd will be, oops, I'm looking at the wrong one, aren't I, Denise? No, Thursday, April 3rd will be community gardens and then happy hour on Wednesday, April 1st, microgreens, tasty, time, tiny and timely. So we will get those out probably sometime tomorrow with the registrations for those as well. And again, we're gonna go as far as we can into the summer with these unless things change dramatically. With that, I'm gonna turn this over to extension educator in Lucas County, Amy Stone. Amy has been asked by our interim director, Jackie Kirby Wilkins, to head the task force for the Spotted Land and Fly. So please give every, Amy your full attention. Amy? All right, well, hello and good afternoon to everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. We're gonna take the next hour to talk about Spotted Lantern Fly. And what we really want, let me get my, there you go, is for master gardeners across the state to join the battle and beat the bug. And so we're gonna talk about um, a little bit of an invasive species review just to kind of remind people this isn't the first invasive species. It has not yet been detected in Ohio, but we're looking for you to help be extra sets of eyes in the, in, um, out in the field looking for this. So once we do the little intro on invasives, we're going to jump right into the spotted lantern fly. We'll talk a little bit about the history, the life cycle, where it's at now that we know of, um, what it does, and how you can help and be engaged in the process. And so hopefully there'll be lots of folks out there who are engaged and interested in this insect and will help us look for it in the future. So when we talk about invasive species, there's, there's really nothing new. Uh, we've had invasive species for a very long time. And now that we're a global society, it just seems to be more on the radar and we hear about it and are experiencing it, especially here in Ohio where we've had our share of invasive species. A lot of people think that, you know, the ports, um, areas where shipments come in from other countries would be a hot um, bed for invasive species, but it really is where that cargo ends up. And it may end up in your county, in your backyard. And so we all have to be aware of what's happening because we are a global society. This non-native tree pest, um, invasive species, it's a worldwide problem. Um, we often hear about what we're dealing with in, in Ohio, in the United States, but we've sent things to other countries. And so if I show this moth to you, you may think, oh gosh, I don't, I don't know what that is. Maybe I've never seen that before. 
if I show you this photo, you may think, what? Well, wait, I've seen that. I've had that in my landscape in, in the past. And so this is our fall webworm, um, a native insect to Ohio. There's plenty of native biocontrols to help regulate populations, although we may see kind of a peaks um, in that every once in a while. But you'll notice in 1979, it was detected in China. So we sent it to China, not on purpose. Um, they gave it a different name. So it's the American white moth. And it's not just a, a common pest there, but it is causing some problems in their fruit um, and orchard industry. And so just to kind of illustrate this two-way street that um, we're not always just on the receiving end. Many of you may have dealt with insects like the gypsy moth. Um, some of you, especially in Northeast Ohio, may have dealt with the viburnum leaf beetle, another non-native um, species that attacks um, our, our viburnums. Notice those insects that I just mentioned were primarily leaf feeders. And although they can be devastating, um, they're not outright killers um, unless they're feeding on, on trees that are already under stress. But this insect, the Asian longhorn beetle, it like Asian or like emerald ash borer, feed in the tissue, the, the wood of the tree, um, and can be a death sentence and is a death sentence. So a much serious, more serious pest than some of the other non-natives. Just to give a shout out, um, if you're not getting the Buckeye Yard and Garden line, you'll want to um, sign up for that newsletter. Um, you can go to where it says alerts and sign up for those. Um, great timely information. And you'll notice if you are receiving the alerts, you're getting lots of them because we're getting into the season and people have the time to make those posts. If you get excited about invasive species and want to learn more, invasive.org is a great website. And so this is one of my go-to favorites and it might be something that you kind of bookmark um, and is one of your favorites in your computer for the future. But let's talk about spotted lanternfly and why we're all here today. So several weeks ago, um, you may have seen or read an article. Um, here are a couple headlines that I saw. Um, destructive insect getting close to the Ohio border, what to know. Um, destructive spotted lantern flies found 15 miles from the Ohio border. And so it was on news stations. It really kind of piqued people's interest. And we'll talk about that find and where those kind of closer infestations to Ohio are right now. So it's, a, it's actually a very pretty insect. Um, if you know me, um, I know I have costumes for emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle. Um, we think there's going to be a costume in the work for spotted lanternfly. Um, so it was a great outreach tool that people can borrow and use. So more on that coming soon. But this insect is native to Asia, specifically uh, this, the countries that are listed there. Know that in 2006, it was found in Korea, which it's not within the native range. So we did learn a lot from the research that was done in Korea. But in North America, it was found in September 2014. And it was an active population in Pennsylvania um, that started out relatively small and isolated, but now has been expanded to 26 counties that it's been found in in Pennsylvania. So if we take a look at the map, that original find was in Berks County, um, clear on the eastern side of Pennsylvania, so far away from Ohio, but again, still on our radar. But now they actually have um, active infestations in those 26 counties in Pennsylvania, along with New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And there's also been various life stages found in three states, in New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. But they're not reproducing populations. So maybe they found an individual that you know, hitchhiked on a vehicle, um, or it was a single egg mass that they were able to remove before it hatched. And so obviously, they're going to watch those areas specifically. But that's kind of where we're at today. And if you take a look at this map, um, They've made some minor changes. So if you've 
kind of been keeping up with this and have looked at the map out of Cornell. Um, previous maps, there were some yellow counties, which actually have changed and they are now counties with dots. So you'll see a lot of those in New York, um, a few in Pennsylvania, and then kind of a cluster here in Maryland and Virginia, Delaware. And so again, the dots indicate that they found a part of the life cycle, uh, but a not, not a reproducing part. Um, the red lines indicate where quarantines currently are. And so you can see the larger quarantine area in the east and now central Pennsylvania. And those two kind of outlier counties in the west um, in Beaver and Allegheny County, which is the big concern because that's where Ohio then meets Pennsylvania, just north of West Virginia. So let's talk a little bit about what this insect eats. And so it's proven. And so if you know a Lanthus or Tree of Heaven, um, you might actually be cheering right now uh, because we thought, oh, maybe a bio to kind of um, attack this non-native plant. But unfortunately, it also likes grapes and about 70 other different plants that we'll talk about in just a second. There is going to be another program coming up um, that will be a super program if you're not sure with how to identify a Lanthus or Tree of Heaven and also comparing some lookalikes. And so I've got some photos up on the screen for you to take a look at. It's actually a copy one to three feet in length. Um, the bottom left hand um, corner of the screen is actually a female Lanthus in bloom or in flower. The stems are very stout as you'll notice in that middle uh, photo. And then the leaflets on the right hand side, you'll notice at the base of each leaflet, or the base of each leaflet, yes, there are glands, so little swollen areas. And so those are some key characteristics that Thomas will actually go into much more depth um, in one of the future classes. But just kind of remember that, keep that in mind, because that's going to come back and we'll talk about that um, in what you can do. This is actually a list of host plants that Virginia has come up with, and it's based on their observations. And so they have found spotted lanternfly eggs, and we'll talk about what that egg mass looks like, on all of the plants that are listed on the left. In addition, if you scroll down, so a lot of common plants that you may have in your own landscape, they've also found egg masses on a Jersey wall, which is those concrete walls and construction areas and a metal 55 gallon drum. Know that these eggs can be laid anywhere. It doesn't specifically have to be on a plant. They've also noticed feeding, but not egg masses, found on this list on the right hand side. So again, a pretty wide range, but also remember, they really have an affinity to Alanthus or Tree of Heaven as their favorite. So as I mentioned earlier, there's possibly 70 different host plants that this insect in different stages will feed on. But let's talk a little bit more about the plant or the insect. Now, this insect is not that big. If it was that big, it would be really easy to detect even in low populations. But now that I have your attention, I'm gonna show this life cycle summary a couple times just so you see it and become familiar with what you're gonna be looking for at what time of the year. Right now, they're in the egg mass stage. Those eggs are gonna hatch into nymphs, probably early May through June. And then we'll see nymphs all the way through summer into the fall, when then we'll see the adults from probably midsummer all the way through up until really we have a, a good freeze. And those adults are gonna lay the egg ma mate and lay eggs in for the next season. So one generation per year, but you'll see overlapping generations of the instars and the adults throughout the season. So I kind of joked that the adults are large. Um, so about one inch long and a half inch wide, very colorful, bright, 
kind of easy to, to detect or easy to see, at least based on this photo. They do have a defense mechanism that when they move their wings, um, you'll actually see the brighter colors underneath. Um, and it's kind of a, a way to scare off other predators or potential predators. Um, but often if they're just sitting there feeding, you're not gonna see those bright reds and yellows and the silver as indicated here. So they have that flashy display once they're disturbed and once they go to take flight. Speaking of flight, um, they're really poor flyers. Um, it's almost like a fluttering, but we have noticed, um, and there's been observations of them kind of flying in mass um, just before they're gonna lay their eggs. And so when we say they're poor flyers, they can uh, you know, move a distance, maybe from a woodlot onto some landscape trees. Um, at first glance, you'll kind of think, boy, it looks almost like a moth. And it can be kind of confusing because it has fly in its name, uh, but they're really neither of those. Um, it is a plant hopper, and when they are feeding, they're actually kind of holding their wings together, and it makes it um, almost like a tent-like appearance. And you can see that in that photo um, on the right-hand side. Here's just a, um, some photos that I grabbed from Pennsylvania just to give you, again, really get your eyes alerted to what you're gonna be looking for um, later in the summer and into the fall. It's important to note, um, because we'll get a lot of or questions and even phone calls, they do not bite or sting people. So they're not dangerous to humans. Rather, they're feeding on the sap from trunks, stems, and sometimes leaves of plants. They will feed in swarms, as indicated here in this photo. So this is an apple tree, but notice where they're congregating near that main trunk. So they're not feeding um, or causing damage to the apple per se, um, but when they do feed in mass, it can be um, you know, quite the sight to notice that. Same thing here, showing that feeding on grapes. And again, you'll notice where the insect is, it's on the stem and not on the grape. Now, ultimately, if there's that much heavy feeding, they can reduce the quality and quantity of the fruit, um, but they're not actually damaging the fruit per se. When the insect feeds on the stem, they excrete honeydew, which probably a lot of us are familiar with as master gardeners, um, but it's not just a honeydew that kind of drips down. Um, it's actually been observed that it kind of squirts like a distance, almost like a, a water gun. And so I've heard stories of people working in the field with this insect, actually on a bright sunny day, having to run to the local store to buy uh, rain gear so they're not getting like squirted on with honeydew in masses. So that honeydew um, is a result of their piercing and sucking mouth parts in the stems and branches of plants. And they do that feeding both as adults and as nymphs. So you'll see here in this illustration created by Joe Boggs where they're actually piercing into that phloem tissue. You can see where the, the activity, that feeding activity often will leave the trees kind of bleeding. But again, also that honeydew um, is um, ex, um, taken out of the insect and kind of squirted um, in other places, which can kind of build up um, on furniture, anything underneath or in the vicinity of where those insects are feeding. The next thing that happens is this black sooty mold. And so I've gone into areas where the entire canopy underneath where these insects have been feeding is just black with the sooty mold or that secondary problem that occurs that again will, will cause some reduction in photosynthesis and can be kind of stressing on those plants. The other thing to look for, and uh, my understanding, this is actually how it was initially detected by a homeowner in Pennsylvania is they noticed an increase of 
in the fall, wasps and hornets around this area where the sap or this honeydew was accumulating. And so they were curious why all of these insects were there. And somebody came out, yes, noticed the hornets and the wasps, but also noticed then the spotted lanternfly and had those identified. So the adults are gonna appear late in the summer. Um, so we won't be looking for those right now, uh, but in the summer numbers can build up pretty high. And so you can see the two of them here um, on the stem. And I love this photo um, just because they're bright and they stand out but in some cases, they can almost camouflage in. And so on this particular photo, there are a dozen spotted lanternfly on that trunk. And so again, you know, they're bright, but they sometimes, you know, can kind of blend into their surroundings. And so you really have to have kind of an eye looking for those. There's just a, a photo of two of them mating um, for that next generation. And then this is what the start of the egg mass looks like. Um, you can see they've been described as chains or rows of individual eggs together. Typically there are 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. Most of the time the eggs are covered with this waxy coating, um, but there have been times where we've seen just exposed eggs. Um, but most of the time they are, you know, you're going to see that coating that's illustrated there. This is a great photo that has the waxy coating, but you can see at the very top some eggs that are still kind of exposed there. This photo, um, if you're familiar with gypsy moth egg masses, so this particular plant had both gypsy moth egg masses and spotted lanternfly um, on that particular plant. So relatively the same size, maybe a little bit smaller than gypsy moth egg masses, um, but very different in their appearance. Gypsy moth is more kind of velvety, felt-like, and soft, uh, where this is almost kind of a hard, mud-like appearance over the top. Those eggs can be laid on any surface, and so the photos that I'm showing, a lot of them are on plants, but um, they can be on anything. So furniture, dog houses, um, vehicles, and um, they think that it probably came into the country on stone from China or pallet material um, that held stone or other material. And so it wasn't actually on, on plant material itself is how it got here. There's just some other photos of some egg masses. And as the season progresses, they actually kind of blend in a little bit more and weather. There's some along that crack in the, the bark there. And some folks say that they actually um, will lay eggs on rusty material. Um, I think they'll lay eggs wherever they are, uh, but maybe have an affinity to rusty train cars, uh, barrels, things like that. So really need to kind of keep your eyes open on a wide variety of surfaces when we talk about the eggs. I had mentioned um, train cars, um, rail cars, and this is really a concern. And so we know that the insect didn't fly from Eastern Pennsylvania to Western Pennsylvania. Um, it, was, it, hit, it hitchhiked. Um, and they're pretty sure that mode of transportation were railways. Um, and so, interesting enough, this is a, a photo that was taken um, in the middle of the Virginia spotted lanternfly infestation, but the trees on both sides of the track include a lot of Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. So, really right now, if you're interested in going out, seeing hey, are there egg masses around? Um, this is some training materials that Penn State put together, but I really enjoyed um, and thought they were good illustrations of what those egg masses look like. And so I wanted to add those into the presentation. 
So we kind of talked about this already, the columns of eggs underneath that substance, 30 to 50 eggs per mass, about an inch in length. But what I want you to look for here is, so you see those eggs, those eggs, how they kind of um, dry or crack over time. An uncovered egg mass above one that's kind of aged. Now finding that egg mass. And so you can see that here, but they really pointed out where that egg mass is. And same thing on this birch and where those egg masses, multiple egg masses are in this case. Same thing on logs and branches. And here on a rusty material. Picnic tables, and then concrete. So multiple eggs, populations that would spread pretty rapidly, um, and you'd have a number of nymphs that then look for in the spring. And this just compares that spotted lanternfly um, egg mass to a gypsy moth egg mass. If you find egg masses, we're going to talk about reporting, uh, but one of the recommendations in Pennsylvania is to scrape and destroy those egg masses. And so reducing the population by doing that. Now again, we don't know, we haven't identified or detected the population here in Ohio. So when we're looking for egg masses, we're looking to identify populations. So we need to alert people of what we found, but ultimately we wanna scrape then and destroy those egg masses to reduce future populations. So let's talk about after the eggs, what happens. So those eggs hatch as nymphs and they go through four stages or instars. The first three instars, the insect is black and white, um, very tiny that first instar um, and will grow as they mature. You can see here um, the, the instar molting from third to fourth. And the fourth instar, although looks the same or similar in appearance um, as far as what the insect looks like structurally, um, but the color pattern changes or is varied. And it has this splash of red that's incorporated into that black and white that we had seen previously. So as the nymphs start to hatch, this is what we're gonna start to look for. Uh, they're gonna feed on plants. Uh, they don't have wings, they're not going to fly, they're not super mobile, uh, but they can kind of hop and they want to obviously find a food source that would make them happy that they can continue their, their life cycle. This just shows you kind of what's present where, and so it's a kind of a good picture to have in your mind, okay, we're in March, what are we going to be looking for? And as you can see in March, so January through May, and then again, fall through the end of the year, they'll be in their egg mass stage of all those photos that I just shared. As the season approaches, so in the end of April, May, June, through the summer and early fall, you're gonna see nymphs or nymphs would be present. And then finally, mid to late summer into um, early winter, we would see adults present. And so we don't wanna be looking for adults now, because we're not gonna see those until probably July, August timeframe in Ohio if they do show up. Notice that the eggs are really the longest stage of the life cycle and they're most responsible for human assisted spread. So they can be moved on any of those materials like dog houses, bird houses, patio furniture, um, firewood, and so there are quarantines in place to restrict that movement so people aren't spreading the insect to other places. The adults are weak flyers, like I had mentioned, they kind of glide more than they fly and are responsible for localized spread and occasional hitchhikers. Um, so if you are visiting family and friends in an infested area, you'd obviously wanna check your vehicle really closely and things going in and out of your car to make sure they're not hitchhiking back to Ohio. The one thing that we really need master gardeners to do, and we're working on the system of how to report that, is to monitor tree of heaven. And so if you have this invasive plant in hopefully maybe not your yard, but maybe in a adjoining yard or in an area of a community that you live in, you can look for 
um, and monitor Tree of Heaven. Here's just some photos and kind of a, a teaser of, of an upcoming educational program that will focus just on Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. The honeydew and sooty mold, um, although this isn't a result from um, spotted lanternfly, but kind of gives you that look of, of things that you would see. And this is really, again, can be pretty bad and in high populations and high numbers. So if we summarize kind of what we're looking for would be the egg masses right now found on any kind of surface. From spring to late summer, we're gonna see the nymphs and then ultimately the adults. Large, very showy, um, focusing on Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. Um, of course, if you are growing grapes in your backyard, um, that would be a priority as well because they um, really do like grapes. You'll notice or look for that heavy sap flow but again, at that point, population numbers are gonna be pretty high. And so hopefully we can catch this earlier before numbers um, are that large. And then in the fall, we're definitely gonna see wasps and hornets, but congregating in large numbers around that sap or honeydew would be another thing to kind of tip our hats to really take a look closer of what's happening. Again, just um, refreshing these photos. I think the more you see this, the more repetition, uh, the easier it'll be to when, hopefully, um, we don't wanna find this, but if we do, we wanna find it early. So those first through third instars on the left and fourth instar on the right, followed by the adults and then the females laying eggs. All right, so here's your little quiz for yourself. Um, what stage are spotted lanternflies at now? And I know I can't get that response, but hopefully everybody yelled out um, eggs. And then this spring, we'll start to see those eggs hatch into the first instar nymphs. Here's some photos that Pennsylvania um, has shared. Again, ways this insect is moving around. So you can see egg masses on the, the firewood or branches. Um, they do kind of cling to people. And so if you're out there, when the adults are present, you want to make sure that you don't have a hitchhiker on your back collar or in your hair, uh, vehicles. And then of course, this tire is amazing to me. Now, when that vehicle moves, most of those insects are going to be squished, right? And probably be killed. Uh, but populations and numbers can, can get relatively high um, as illustrated there in that photo. Now, Pennsylvania is, and other states that have spotted lanternfly have quarantine areas. And so they're trying to do their best to not move the insect um, artificially or have the insect moved artificially. And so this is one thing that the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has done. And it's kind of a checklist for residents and what you have to do or what you need to check before you move outside of the quarantine. And so I think it's just a, a point to illustrate that they're trying to do the best they can to get their arms around the insect and kind of keep it where it's at um, and trying to get that word out to others of, hey, start looking for things. Um, I know my niece works um, for a company that gets a lot of deliveries by FedEx. And she called me from her office probably a couple months ago and said, hey, Aunt Amy, um, I talked to the FedEx guy and they're requiring their trucks to be washed um, and inspected on a regular basis looking for spotted lanternfly. And so they're, you know, serious about getting the word out and hopefully really cutting down on this artificial movement of the pest. In Pennsylvania, they also have these, this permit system. So if you're working in and out of the quarantine, um, it's kind of self-regulated. Um, but you go through training, and again, the goal or the objective is to not spread the insect um, artificially. So let's take a look. Now, the next few slides that I'm going to show are things that will probably be in our future. So um, especially when we talk about the tree banding and the insecticides. Um, so one way you can monitor 
for Olanthus um, and for spotted lanternfly on Olanthus is just visual survey. So you can go out, you can look for egg masses, you can look for nymphs, you can look for adults. Um, in Pennsylvania, they are doing some tree banding. Um, so they've got these sticky bands and as the insect moves up and down the tree, it attaches itself to that sticky band. And so know that those sticky bands are gonna collect lots of other things. And so it's not just gonna be spotted lanternfly. And so there's been some concern that birds and butterflies and other things have kind of gotten caught up in that. And so you've got to decide if that's worth that, or if you're just gonna do that visual survey at least to begin with. So one thing you'd look again up and down that main stem where you'd have a lot of um, adult activity, especially. Um, they're doing um, a trap tree method, which again, this is, would be in our future. Uh, but killing most of the Alanthus, primarily the female Alanthus that are reproducing, um, and then treating some remaining Alanthus with a systemic pesticide. Um, and you can see that those Alanthus came in contact with that or um, took in the um, insecticide and then died. And so they have a lot of information about these different trap tree methods. Again, we're not there yet. It's mostly just the visual surveys that we're looking at um, because we haven't found it. But I just wanted you to kind of be alert of what some things you may see if you're looking at other information from other states. Here's just some of that tree banding. And you can see, especially on that left, um, there's lots of other things besides spotted lanternfly that kind of get stuck on those traps. Pennsylvania does have a um, spotted lanternfly management guide for homeowners. Um, really good. Um, we are not recommending any pesticide at this time because the insect is not here. Um, and some people, you know, are just, they, hey, they want to protect, they want to do the good thing. Um, but just know that it's there. Uh, but any insecticides aren't going to be made until after the insect has been found. I want to just kind of briefly update you um, also on what's happening kind of across the state with multiple agencies or organizations. And so yesterday, the Ohio Department of Agriculture called a meeting um, along with USDA APHIS, which is the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, Ohio State University, and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And we got together and um, had a conversation and are developing an action plan, um, and the action plan actually is, has kind of already been developed, at least in the preliminary stages. So we're dusting that off and kind of implementing it at this point with those new finds in Western Pennsylvania. So some of those things that we talked about yesterday included outreach, which ODA, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, is very um, a strong proponent of and are looking for extension to help get the word out to other people. So you'll see there'll be upcoming trainings, there'll be surveys. If the insect is found, there will be some quarantines um, to help mitigate the spread of it into other parts of the state. Uh, we talked a little bit about control options, although again, until we find the insect, it's really not on the radar at this point, how we're gonna communicate, and then we also explored some funding issues. There'll be websites that are specific for this insect. Uh, we are going to be using the USDA Pest Alert, and Nancy, um, Ashley Kulhanek, um is authoring a fact sheet, um, and so that will be Ohio-specific, and that will be coming out of the presses pretty shortly. Um, also, any contact or any activity, um, social media, club groups, um, the goal is to have uh, PowerPoint and training materials for master gardeners who are interested and have those connections. Uh, Pennsylvania, or Penn State, excuse me, um, really relies heavily on Master Gardener volunteers to help with this outreach. And so we're looking um, to do the same here in Ohio. There are gonna be surveyors from those different state and federal agencies that are gonna be doing some of the surveying, but there's no way that they can survey everywhere with the limited staff and limited budget. 
So we're looking for volunteers um, to also help with this survey work. And primarily that survey work initially is gonna be on Atlantis populations. Um, the goal is to look uh, for Atlantis that are in main um, arteries of transportation. Um, they're also gonna be working with vineyards and orchard owners um, to hopefully do some monitoring um, on their own properties and report what they're seeing. I found this interesting. So this is a map that the Ohio Department of Agriculture shared yesterday of railways. And so just thinking if you know, you're in your house and you're near a railway, um, would that be a mode, a potential mode of transportation for this insect? Um, and so they've identified those railways. They've also identified interstates um, and looking at where like rest stops, truck stops, um, along those interstates to be areas that they're gonna focus on. Initially, um, they'd like to focus in the Orange Counties in Ohio, and primarily that's gonna be with uh, both volunteers and staff. But if you're in Butler County, far reaches away from those Orange Counties, right? Um, or in Toledo, so I'm, my county is not orange. Um, but think, so if it jumped from Eastern Pennsylvania to Western, what's to say it's not gonna show up somewhere else? Now, logically, they're gonna focus on the areas closest to the known infestation in Pennsylvania, uh, but I think we all need to be alert and potentially looking for this pest in our own counties. They have done some growing degree day um, accumulations, and so if you're familiar with that, uh, first nymphs are likely to be observed at about 200 growing degree day units. Um, and so that's just actually a little bit lagging behind uh, when we see gypsy moth caterpillars hatch, um, another non-invasive that I've been working on. The peak of nymph emergence actually is at 355 growing degree days. First adults are usually observed about uh, 1,160 growing degree day units. And then finally, the peak adult emergence is at just over 1,500. And so that information, um, especially as it relates to growing degree days, will be updated uh, in the Buckeye Yard and Garden line on a regular basis. But this map kind of just illustrates the movement um, of where the, the emergence will be or predicted if it's there. Ohio does not have a quarantine in place at this point, but they are discussing that if the insect is found. So right now we have three spotted lanternfly banners that can be used for outreach and engagement. Um, the goal is to purchase some additional banners for events that maybe master gardeners are involved with, county fairs. Um, so let us know, we're working on how to get that information and then how to move those banners to different from county to county. Also, we have um, also developed by Ashley Kulhanik and Kathy Smith, um, these ID cards for spotted lanternfly. And so those are great to give out. Um, I've got mine right here. So just the size of a business card, but a lot of information. And also tells you how to report if you suspect that you have spotted lanternfly. Um, in addition to the fact sheet, we will be utilizing the pest alert. It's a lot of good information on that. Um, key messages that we um, want to get out. One is that it's not an outright killer of landscape and woodland plants. So it's not going to come into your landscape and just kill everything. Um, it is a nuisance pest on its numbers, um, as well as the honeydew and the sooty mold that is created as a result. Um, it can weaken plants. Um, it is a huge pest concern on grapes, um, and then also on hops and other fruit trees. Early detection is critical. So the earlier we can find this and actually put management practices into place is gonna be important. Um, we've talked about what signs and symptoms to look for. So you can actually be out in the field watching for this pest. And then how to report. 
ultimately the report needs to go through the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm going to skip that just for timing. Um, know that um, Ohio State is going to have a designated website for spotted lanternfly. We have three go.osu.edu links. So SLF, spotted lanternfly, and spot the spot. Um, hopefully within the next week, two weeks, this will be live with lots of information and lots of resources. So fact sheets, recorded PowerPoints, videos, um, as we get more information that'll be on this site. Um, and it also link to other states that have information that we can use. Just a reminder, make sure that you're familiar with um, Tree of Heaven or Alanthus. And one way that you can report and help us right now is reporting that Alanthus or Tree of Heaven using the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. And so I'm sure that there's a few of you out there that have the app already. Um, but if you go both um, iPhone and Android, you can download the app, it's free, um, Great Lakes Early Detection Network. And what you'll find is a list of all invasive species. And so in the case of um, Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, you'd scroll down to the tree section and you'll see a list of trees. And so this is a multi-state um, app. And so each state kind of brought their list to the app. You can click on whatever plant you want, but in this case, we're gonna look, be looking at Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. There's images. And so those dots both um, at the bottom there will be the number of images for each of those plants. So it can be a helpful tool to kind of compare what you're seeing out in the field um, to make sure that truly is Alanthus. There's a description, and then we use the EDD maps. So early detection and distribution mapping system. So you would have a, a username and a password. You would log into that maps system and you would make a report. And so this report is an example actually of Oriental Bittersweet, but you would attach a photo. Um, you would use the GPS coordinates. You can list how many time or how many minutes that you've spent making the report. Uh, Wisconsin especially is using this with volunteers. Uh, the size of the infestation, is it a single plant? Is it a half acre? Is it 10 plants? Whatever information you can help um, give us, you can draw a space on the maps that, hey, this whole area is infested or it's just one spot. That report um, will upload into the queue. And so if you're out in the field doing a lot of these reports, once you get back to a reliable wireless signal, um, you can then hit upload and they'll all go off um, into the system. You just remember you've got to hit that to upload them um, or to send them because they'll just stay in the queue until you do that. And so this is what it looks like. And so if we confirm, yep, that's Alanthus, that's Tree of Heaven, it becomes a red dot. And so that's our first goal is to find out, okay, where the Alanthus is in the state of Ohio. And then as we progress, there's gonna be a manual with some information on how to report both negative and positive. And so obviously you can do the same thing with the spotted lantern fly on that app. And so if there's, you know, you're seeing signs and symptoms of spotted lantern fly, you would hit the insect and do that report. Um, you can also make a negative report that I haven't found, you know, I'm looking at Alanthus, but I haven't found any signs and symptoms of spotted lantern fly. So this is just kind of where we're at today. Um, this map can change. And so you need to stay updated on what's happening. Um, and hopefully, you know, we don't have a lot of infestations that pop up in Ohio this year, but we really need to be looking. With that, um, so there were some questions in the chat box as we were going along, but can can kind of take and cover those real quickly. It looks like we've got Amy, about minutes. Amy, um, the biggest question people have right now is uh, how do you remove and destroy the eggs? Okay, so really good question. The first thing is if you find the egg mass, we've got to report it first, right? 
And so uh, we've got some time before they start emerging. So taking that photo, um, calling the Department of Agriculture, your local extension office to get somebody out there to confirm that is what it is indeed. Uh, once it's confirmed and we've, we've got that, um, a business card or um, some kind of tool that you can kind of scrape behind the egg mass um, is probably the best. And if you put it into like a container or a baggie, you don't want to just scrape and let the eggs fall on the ground um, because they could emerge in that stage. So you want to collect them. Um, and then you can smash them, you can, you know, bury them deep, right, so they don't come out, um, or you can tie them up um, and then um, when they hatch, if there's nothing to eat, um, they'll die in that bag. A really good question. Is this covered egg mass hard like plastic or soft and sticky like goo? So it's more hard. Um, it's not soft. And so it's kind of covered almost like, I don't want to say cement, but uh, maybe like a mud. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be hard. Okay. What about wild grapevine as a host? So um, it has been found on wild grapes as well as cultivated grapes. Um, so you, if you've got a lot of grapevine around and you could look at, uh, look at that um, too. Uh, do the lanterns, spotted lanternfly, have any natural predators both here and in Asia? So there um, is a fungus and an insect um, that they are looking at. Um, they actually, in one area, um, Ann Hayek with Cornell has found um, a fungus, this disease that has kind of knocked them back. Um, so they're trying to learn more about that. Um, there were some folks that were actually supposed to leave to go to China, um, I think this month, um, to do some more work on native biocontrols in China, uh, but with the whole situation, um, that trip is not happening. Okay. Other than physical removal of egg clusters, what other methods are being used to control them? So, I mean, removing the egg masses, um, the nymphs, um, you know, banding of the trees, removing those. Um, adults, the same thing with the banding. Um, hand removal, although in a high population, I mean, it it's, can be overwhelming. Um, there are some traps that they're working on. They haven't identified a pheromone, like a lure to bring them into the traps. Uh, but there will be some traps that are going to be put out in Ohio to try to help with that monitoring or that early detection. Um, and then, of course, insecticide treatments, uh, both in vineyards, orchards, uh, but in a landscape situation as well. Can trap plants be placed at rest stations along major highways to allow for early detection? The plants would need to be scouted regularly. Really good question, and that's one of the things um, that the state is looking at. So first identifying where the Alanthus is, um, and usually Alanthus um, can pop up anywhere, and so often we find them along um, transportation corridors. So identifying the trees and then looking for them on a regular basis. Know that the state um, will have people doing that, but they are looking for help. And so once we have that identified of what that protocol is, we'll, we'll be getting it out to volunteers and to the public to help look for this past, this upcoming season. Two questions here. Uh, how big are the first nymphs when they hatch and do you need to save the actual nymph or adult if you find them? So uh, first instar nymphs are very small. Um, I mean, like, tick like kind of small. I mean, you're going to have to really be looking for them, unless, of course, there's masses amount of them. Um, yeah, so you will we'll want to collect um, and either put in rubbing alcohol, um, you can put in a container and put it in the freezer if you want. Uh, but yeah, we're going to actually need that insect, ODA, USDA, for the actual confirmation. And so it goes through that process. And so 
If you're finding anything that you suspect is spotted lanternfly, collect that and then um, get photos or the actual samples to ODA. Do, does ODA have inspectors out scouting on a regular basis in the counties near the PA border? So they're gonna be utilizing um, some of their nursery inspectors and other staff. Um, and again, they're gonna focus on primarily those orange counties, um, but we'll take any information from any of the counties if somebody suspects that they see that. Um, they're also looking at high trafficked areas, so truck stops, um, rest stops, rail yards, uh, which can sometimes be a little um, concerning. Obviously, there needs to be a lot of safety issues with rail yards and people in and out. And so, um, you know, they're working with those companies to have their staff go through that training um, to be able to do some, some monitoring. Should we remove Tree of Heaven or will that increase pressure on grapes and fruit? So really good question. Um, what's the, the goal, I believe, um, for commercial vineyards is to really reduce the amount of Alanthus outside of the vineyard. Um, so they're not kind of feeding on that plant and then coming into the grapes. Um, there's a lot of research that's being done and worked on, um, but definitely the preference um, is the Alanthus. And so what I've heard a lot of people say is look and see, okay, we've got female and male Alanthus. Let's remove the female so we don't have that reproducing population, leaving a male Alanthus behind as kind of our trap tree or monitoring tree. What range of temperatures can it withstand, both high and low? So I don't have that information um, right in front of me. Um, and some of that is obviously the temperatures that we've experienced as far as highs and lows. Um, but I, would, I can find more information out for you and, and share that. We are also working, and these, these are great questions for a frequently asked question um, page. And so I'll be using a lot of your questions that you have today um, as, as the start of that document. Okay, uh, we have one final question here and then we'll wrap up with some uh, odds and ends. Does the fly feed on other fruits such as blackberries and blueberries? So, um, so the plant hopper um, will feed on other fruits. Um, and even I saw an article um, or somebody post that it was feeding on some vegetables. Uh, but I think that that might just be, um, you know, individual insects trying to find their way and find their preferred food source. Um, so although you may find them on other plants, um, really Alanthus and grapes are probably the top two that we really need to be concerned about. And could you repeat the go.osu.edu uh, link again, please? Sure, and so it's not gonna take you anywhere just yet. Um, you may get that opening page, but it's um, SLF for spotted lanternfly, or you can spell it out, spotted lanternfly, or um, spot the spot. So there are three go links right now that would get you to that once the site is up and running. Okay, Amy, thank you very much for your presentation. A couple odds and ends things. I am going to launch a very quick poll. Those of you who are online, if you would answer this poll real quick. And while you're doing that, you will be getting information on the recording on where to find it. We have not yet decided where these are gonna be housed, most likely on the State Master Gardener website. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, BMS will be recording um, or will have that recording. Um, you'll have all the links and descriptions from the email in the recording so you can go back and see some of the slides again and you'll be able to slow it down, speed it up, stop whatever you need to see it. And also, um, oh, there was one final thing and I forget what I was going to say. Oh, the name of the app is the Great Lakes Education Early Detection Network. Great Lake Early Detection Network. And Amy, is that available in both um, Google and Apple? It is, so Android and iPhone versions, yes. 
Okay, and as far as the polling, Amy, 100% of the people said this was very useful. Thank you very much. Uh, they all plan to attend on another Lunch and Learn just about, and 37% of us out of 475 people have uh, attended or planted something in the garden, so I really appreciate that information. Um, one couple final things here. Amy is in charge again of the task force, so watch for more information coming out. The information will go out through the Master Gardener listserv and then will be sent to our volunteers. You will all receive one hour credit for continuing education for today's session and for the sessions that are forthcoming. Next week's session will include uh, Tuesday, March 31st, Denise Ellsworth, Bees in Your Backyard. Happy Hour on Wednesday at 4 p.m. April 1st, Microgreens, Tasty, Tiny, and Timely with Natalie Bumgardner, University of Tennessee Vegetable Specialist. And Thursday, April 3rd, Jacqueline Kowalski will presenting, be presenting Best Practices for MGVs and Community Food Projects. So we appreciate your time. We appreciate you coming on. Thanks for being patient with us and getting this um, set up. I think the webinar went very well. Yes, we had a few little uh, glitches with the audio, but I, I expect that may be happening because of lots of people using the internet and bandwidth right now. Um, we will see you then again next week. You will get a follow-up email after this, and then tomorrow watch for emails for registration for next week's Lunch and Learn and Hort Happy Hour. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate your time and uh, stay safe.